Welcome everybody. I'm Yeti Bay Evans, creative producer at GBH Radio and Television. Welcome to the special rendition of Beyond the Page. With April being National Poetry Month, we've gathered four amazing poets for you to enjoy and ask questions at the end of the evening. In a few minutes, we will be joined by Worcester's youth po poet, Laurette Adele Miha, Boston's first ever youth poet, Laurette Alondra Babadia, Bobadia, Worcester's poet laureate and author of 12 published poetry books, Juan Matos, and finally the award-winning Puerto Rican poet Raquel Salas Rivera. Before we get started though, I want to explain how this evening's event will work. So we're using Zoom webinar. As our audience, we can't see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. So you can ask questions during the course of our poetry readings by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put in your questions in at any point during our conversations throughout the evening. And we'll do our best to address as many questions as we can after hearing all of our poets and their readings. And if you see a question that you really want the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab. And the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list and help me to see them more easily. To activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen, then select the live transcript. Two transcription display options will pop up we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. But you can also select full transcript. A sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind though, that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you all our first poet of the evening, Ariel Mija. Ariel is a 2021 Burncoat High graduate, beginning his term at Worcester's Youth po Poet Laureate at the beginning of 2022. Following his senior year of high school, he joined Worcester's first Create 508 program, which aims to educate and empower young creatives interested in community development and entrepreneurship. Ariel, plans to work with public and alternative schools, specifically with mental health and rehabilitation programs. Please help me welcome Ariel. Thank you for joining us. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate um, y'all's love for poetry. Um, anyway, my name is Adael Mejia. My stage name is Ace Meeks. Um, I've been doing poetry for about three years now, seriously, but um, I think I've had that poet side of me. I've expressed that poet side of me um, all my life. Um, so yeah, do I do I get started into, into my poem? All right. I, yes, please. I'm excited. Okay, okay. Oof. <clears throat> Poised and misunderstood. The kid's name doesn't matter. Nowhere else to go. Little ghetto brings comfort. The crowd stands. They love the hood. His voice alone symbolizes home. His astral, it makes peace with the throne. And then the boy picks up the microphone. This is a man's world, said the kid's abuser. Now there's humiliation that's translucent. It's the eyes of the traumatized. It's a mesmerizing moment for most. In this kid's heart, this will be memorized. The page continues. The passion displayed is respected. Jumping with his emotions, his kicks fly. Effortless to come from the grave of paradise. But the introduction didn't mention. He's straight out of section eight, freshly neglected. This boy's lifetime will shine and joy his rain, it will rain. Look at my face, 
This boy needs a gospel, all eyes to the main stage. This, that, new breath, Jason, new mask, Kanye, level, stop, breathe. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to my world. City lights, cameras, action, nonstop attention. I'm into fashion now. I came from hand-me-downs. Now I'm on TV acting a rationale. The main attraction, cameras flashing. Do you see what I see? Ghost, stars, God. Witness the living legend. Open the heavens. It's the leader of the youth. Come on, one time for the energy. The sky is falling, so I'm raising the roof. No choice but to save the planet. Honey, where's my super suit? Stars and supernovas fill the room. Future Picassos, Frida Kahlo's, kings, queens. Put your hands to the ceiling if you live in the dream. Now I'm a bench boy who became a starter. Now we talk in Hall of Fame and I know I'm making farther working harder. I'm like my father, but that's okay. My mother's hard work paved the way. In a room of actors, dancers, and models, eh, I'm one tough act to follow. Yeah, that's uh, that. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions, we'll get to them at the end. We really appreciate you sharing with us, Ariel, and look forward to hearing from you more. Our next poet was named Boston's first ever Youth Poet Laureate in January of 2020. She uses her writing to highlight social issues that impact her and her community. Through her own work, she demonstrates how creative expression can be a powerful tool for youth to examine feelings around issues, find their voice, and speak up about the changes they want to see for their future. Welcome, Alondra Bobadilla. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Alondra Bobadilla, and I'm going to just be reading one piece today. Um, it's fairly new. I haven't read it in so many places, but um, I love this poem so much <laughs> for so many reasons. And it's called When Caged Birds Fly. Even in the city caged birds fly. Wings slicing through marijuana clouds, weaving through bullets, resting on broken bones. They sing over sirens and bellow over empty boasts. Whistles are signals of hope when the morning sun aches to rise over vicious cycles. It's the same day every day for those who lost their brothers. Their eyes are open, but all they see is red and their ears are tuned to the same song of birds singing over bodies. Everybody in the city wears stories, walking murals moving in patterns, never in the same place twice. And if they are, the wise make themselves like shadows and the weak are mouths that mutter things about money and vengeance and sets and baby mamas and regret and the stench of Henny lingering in the words that struggle to hold a note upon fumbling out of their lips. Stories being told through the voice of their chains clashing against their chests and their hips dancing to a music nobody outside of the city walls can hear. And they whisper, and they whisper, but some of them scream they've been robbed. And their voices can be heard clamoring in the streets. On the corner, the brave of them mumble something about restorative justice, cycle breakers, they call them, the ones that get patted on the back for making it out, but always somehow find themselves back, they throw out words that the generations have never heard before. And the crowds gather. And the crowds stop hearing. But they preach anyways. On the block, dusk till dawn, about heaven and a life that never ends, and a life beyond the cycles in the middle of hell, they preach Jesus. 
They call them crazy because they leave circles, protests, and movements. You can't save nobody. The crowd screams. There's no hope for the lost souls. But waves of them are birthing up out of ashes in defiance to apathy. And their faith in a tomorrow is the centerpiece from which they are anchored. They find refuge in the lines carved out on brick complexes. Their existence is a complex and the city is a bubble. Buildings blocking vision beyond tragedy and submission to the vicious cycles that the sun aches to rise over. Every morning the birds whistle and the song has become one with the dissonance of bullets hitting bodies and ricocheting through the wind echoing behind the melody of the caged birds that even in the city, they fly. Thank you. Wow, that was really incredible. I really appreciate you sharing and um, I can see how you're encouraging others to express them, express their emotions through poetry. I really appreciate um, your poem. Thank you so much. Just as a reminder, everybody, uh, if you would like to ask our poets questions, please add them to our Q&A tab that is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll be doing the Q&A after our next two poets. Our next poet of the evening is Worcester's Poet Laureate and has taught Spanish literature and ESL for 32 years, mostly in Worcester public schools. He wrote and published 12 poetry books and anthologies and founded several literary, literary groups and workshops. He has a long record of advocating for poetry and the arts. Welcome Juan Matos. Thank you. Thank you so very much for having me. It's real, it's a, a pleasure sharing poetry with all of you. And I really appreciate the participation of these talented young writers. Uh, today, I would love to share with you a poem. The title is Boot on the Throw, uh, and it's dedicated to Black Lives Matter martyrs in the light of Black Lives Matter mural uh, done in the city of Worcester last year. On the throw of history, there is a suffocating Black boot that bears the weight of dominant whiteness. The hands of history are bound behind her by modern chocolates, white of sharp age plastic that also hobbles the black uncles of history as she gaps and moans, I can. Breathe, I can't breathe. The ancestral boot is powerful, notes its own authority, ignores the clamor of history. On feeling forward that throat and the life being snuffed out under its weight of white centuries. The boot perpetuates suffocation for centuries, repeated, castrating. It discriminates, pursues, accuses, beats, imprisons, dehumanizes, buries the tombs to keep history hiding away buries the tombs to keep history hiding away. The same history murdered by the boots. Death ignored, silenced, forbidden. History is now attired, enhanced with cosmetic comb by the force of the boot that centuries all oppression omnipresent in the street, in the prisons, falsified in the schools, denied before the altars, blindfolded 
in the courts of law. It doesn't matter what name history is given. There has been so many of her sons stifled under that boot that another is simply that, one more, and one more, and one more, like the other one yesterday, that to and tomorrow another more, until a volcanic eruption of asphyxiated throat burns the universe apart after that other corpse who will not be the last one of the corpus and all of the yesterday corpuses exploded like lava with today's howl down the multiple streets with the cry of the world whose indignation floods the world of hate, the structure of hate with an oceanic shout of enough, enough full of shame and a telluric beat of vociferous avalanche. I can breathe. I can't breathe. And the street filled with angry hearts and at every latitude among all races where swells of roar in unison a single fanfare determined to destroy the genocidal bots and shining clamors reinvent the future without those infamous boots on the body of new history written, written by the people. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Juan. Just so our audience knows, this is the first time that uh, I know I'm getting to uh, hear these poems and uh, they're quite moving. Thank you all so much for sharing your energy with us. And next we get to hear from Raquel Salas Rivera. Raquel is a bilingual Puerto Rican poet who writes in Spanish and English Focusing on the experience of being a migrant to the United States, the colonial status of Puerto Rico, and on identifying as a queer. In 2019, Rivera was named an Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellow and served as a 2018-2019 Poet Laureate of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Rivera now writes and teaches in Puerto Rico and is the author of a full-length poetry books. Welcome, Raquel. Uh, un placer. It's such a pleasure to read um, with, with all of you and to hear you. I feel very honored. Uh, gracias, Juan. Gracias, Adael. Gracias, Alondra. It's very meaningful. And I like the flag, Alondra. Eh, I'm just going to read. Um, voy a leer un poema, ¿verdad? De mi nuevo poemario. In español and English, I'm going to read a poem from my new book in Spanish and English. Qué bonito. Y es parte de una serie. It's part of a series um, called La Independencia de Puerto Rico. It's part of a series called The Independence of Puerto Rico. La Independencia de Puerto Rico. Somos más fieros que la nieve derretida. Somos más grandes que un cementerio de vagones. Somos más rabiosos que los vientos atascados. Somos más inmensos que los ríos en el mar. Somos más amplios que las tiranías gastadas. Somos más tiernos que las raíces con la tierra. Somos más tiernos que la lluvia en el musgo. Somos más tiernos que el temblor del aguacero. Somos más fuertes que los años fajones. Somos más bravos que la angustia acosadora. Somos más bellos que que el, las monarquías universales, somos más geos que la buena vida soñada, somos más ricos que los puertos robados, somos más piratas que los gobiernos federales, somos más justicieros que los dioses armados, somos más más que lo más mínimo, somos más más que lo más mejor, somos insularmente suficientes. No le demos a nadie la vergüenza, 
No le debemos a nadie la pequeñez. Nos dicen por toda una vida siglada y quintuplegada que somos la menor de las mayores, que somos mucho de lo menos y muy poco de lo más. Pero somos más de lo que dicen, más de lo que se imaginan y más de lo que hasta hoy nos hemos imaginado. Somos las bibliotecas de las casas juntadas en una huelga de datos que añoran sus entrañas de carne historiada. Somos una latitud de correas atadas, sierpes que mudaron su piel de castigo por una cinta de medir el globo para saber si el mundo puede expandirse abriendo pechos. Somos ese cálculo que traza hoy y toca fondo. Somos la fortaleza sin españoles, la caja torácica que expira el viejo imperio donde antes se almacenaban cruzadas. Somos fatales, es decir, la muerte de las trincheras y los gobiernos que las inducen. Somos altaneros en la costa y humildes en la cordillera, por eso recogemos café y lo sembramos en los edificios que construimos, los niños que cuidamos, las solicitudes exponenciales que completamos. Y en todos somos independientes. Hasta en el hueco más colonizado del temor poroso, hasta en la panadería más llena de periódicos de anuncios, hasta en el acto corrosivo de decir que somos islas solamente. Hasta eso lo hemos hecho mirándonos las caras, juntando los bloques de cemento, armando los almacenes de los vecinos, hasta en la lejanía hemos sido nosotros, nosotros los que llegamos al correo y enviamos latas y baterías. No temas lo que ya conoces. Llevamos una vida temiéndonos mientras nos roban extraños. Míranos bien, ¿no ves que somos hermosura? The independence of Puerto Rico. We are fiercer than melted snow. We are bigger than storage cemeteries. We are more rabid than mired winds. We are immenser than rivers and sea. We are wider than wasted tyrannies. We are more tender than roots with earth. We are more tender than rain in moss. We are more tender than downpours tremor. We are stronger than overworked years. We are braver than stalking anguish. We are more beautiful than universal monarchies. We are more hevels than the dreamt good life. We are richer than stolen ports. We are more pirates than federal governments. We are more justice seeking than armed gods. We are more more than the minimum and more more than the most. We are insularly sufficient. We owe no one shame. We owe no one smallness. They tell us for a whole century in quintuplanetary life that we are the smallest of the upper, that we are much of the less and too little of the more, but we are more than what they say, more than what they imagine and more than to this day we have imagined. We are home libraries gathered in a data strike that miss their bowels of history flesh. We are a latitude of tied belts, serpents who shed their punishing skin, make a tape to measure the globe and know if the world can expand by opening chests. We are that calculation that traces today and hits rock bottom. We are the fortaleza without Spaniards, the rib cage that expires the old empire where before they housed crusades, we are fatal, meaning the death of trenches and the governments that induce them. We are high and mighty on the coast and humble in the mountains. So we gather coffee and plant it in the buildings we build, the children we raise, the exponential applications we complete, and in all things we are independent. Even in the most colonized hole of our poorest sphere, even in the panaderia most packed with papers that cover ads, even in the corrosive act of saying we are only an island, even that we have done, looking each other in the face, gathering cement blocks, arming the neighbor's storage rooms, even from afar, it has been us who has gone to the post office and sent cans and batteries. Don't fear what you already know. We spent a lifetime fearing ourselves while getting robbed by strangers. Look at us, look closely. Don't you see we are beauty? That brings up so much for me um, as an Alaska native person. I share a lot of those sentiments, thank you. And next we get to move into the audience's questions. I see we have several that have come in here. 
And if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in the Q&A, which is again at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So we have Maddie who's asking Juan or letting you know Juan that your poem is amazing. And they believe you mentioned that it was inspired by Black Lives Matter. Will you please give the title again? The title is Boot on the Throw. And you can find it at um, Worcester uh, Telegram Magazine. It's been uh, published there since last year. And uh, the original version is La Bota Sobre el Cuello. And it's both uh, version English and Spanish. Great, that's awesome. Thank you, Juan. Uh, we have another question, and I believe this comes to everybody. Uh, the question is, when did you start considering yourself a poet? Juan, perhaps you could answer first. Well, that brings me immediately to my mom. My mom was my teacher in third, fourth, and fifth grade. And then in my days, uh, down there in the Dominican Republic, uh, there is a, a wonderful tradition of poetry and literature in classrooms. And uh, I was inspired by my elementary teachers. And I started writing poems. Uh, I remember my first one, I was sometimes, I think it was fourth or fifth grade. And of course it was a simple poem for my mother. And uh, like Adael, who's a genius, I used to recite the poems in, uh, from my memory. And the, the, the people at the school like it. And, uh, but it wasn't until I was in high school that I took it seriously. Uh, after our country was invited um, by the United States and other forces, and um, there was poetry and art were a part of the resistance to social injustice. And then we joined writing a lot and dramatizing and all of things to bring the consciousness, social consciousness to our people. So since I would say uh, the end of the, the 60s, 68, 67, I took poetry really seriously. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Juan. Yeah. Raquel. My grandfather was a poet from the Wahana generation and my mother's a poet, but I didn't consider myself a poet until I read um, Langston Hughes. Maybe I was 12 and I was in Houston, Texas and um, I read poems that made me cry. And I said, I wanna do that. I wanna make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how I started. Success. <laughs> Terrible goal, right? <laughs> oh, moving your poetry. Alondra. <laughs> um, well, for starters, Raquel, making people cry is actually, that's a good thing. Crying is good. <laughs> Crying is refreshing, okay? It's healing. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I really don't like, um, like, labels that uh, have to do with any form of leadership or work or interest and I think the reason why is because sometimes everything feels very uh commodified everything kind of feels like it's always attached to some sort of like I don't know it it, it sucks the the life out of it I guess sometimes labeling yourself or that's how I always used to feel so I never really liked the term um like poet I've also danced for so many years never liked the term dancer, or like bailarina, like, no, I just, just wasn't for me. Um, I think I started accepting it and being like, you know, I guess redefining what like those kinds of labels mean to me um, in high school, when I started reading literally for my like high school classmates. Um, teenagers are a really tough crowd and they will rip you to shreds if they don't like you, but <laughs> <laughs> my peers, my peers showed me the utmost support and still today I say that they are the ones that got me to where they are and they recognize me as their poet, as if I belonged to them. So <laughs> that like, yeah, yeah, you. She's like, you know, so for me, I, you know, I guess that's kind of where I started seeing myself as a poet, because then I saw those terms as like, instead of, you know, oh, 
you know, creo que esa te cree, like, you know, what do you think, you know, who do you think that you are using these kinds of like terms? And I see them as so honorary that now I see it as no, but like, that's what I do. And that's my interest. That's how I connect to my community. That's how people respond to me. That's how people know me. So there's nothing wrong with being like, yeah, I'm a poet. That's what I do. And how people respond to that statement is up to them. <laughs> yes, great. That's awesome. I'm happy to hear that you started in high school and were well received. I have um, three teenagers. Well, two are now young in their young 20s, but um, wow, they can definitely do you a number. <laughs> uh, I used to teach school as well, so <laughs> you know how it feels. Um, Adeyel. Uh, hello. Um, <clears throat> I, to this day, um, don't really think I'm a poet, consider myself a poet, um, pretty illiterate, grammatically incorrect, also politically incorrect. Um, but um, I'm a great artist. I am a master of a lot of crafts. Um, I just make it work somehow. And only time I'm really a poet is when I'm writing a grant, but that's, that's for another time. Um, <laughs> I've been writing since uh, I was I was little little. I I love to write. Uh, I was never really good in school, and instead of doing the work I was supposed to be doing, I just sit there doodling, um, writing stories. Mm -hmm. I'd go on for pages and pages. Like I swore I was an author as a kid. Um, after that, I got into music pretty heavy. Uh, I love all kinds of genres. Uh, my favorite genres right now are definitely 1950s uh, blues, jazz. Uh, I love that scene. There was so much enriching culture within the music at the time. Uh, but bring me here today. Um, I just write. I just love to write and I do it to my best ability. Sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's happy, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, just like life. <laughs> That's the oh, richness of it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I have another question that's um, for all of you. So what are your favorite ways to share your poems, to spread your messages and share your perspectives? Come on, young people, go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and share poems. Oh, I like sharing poetry in all the ways, like having it on paper and reading it like we're reading it now. I used to memorize my poems, but I became lazier with age and my memory is not as good as it was, or as elastic mm -hmm. as it was when I was younger. But um, I like posting my poems. I very bad at TikTok. I'm still very millennial, so I apologize. <laughs> but all other forms of sharing poetry, I like. Right. I prefer, uh, honestly, I prefer to be in, in, a, in front of the, the audience, especially uh, high school or college students. Uh, I feel better uh, not only because having the opportunity to touch and see their faces and get in touch about the reaction right there, but also uh, after the poetry reading, those kind of conversation and, 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 and the questions and answers, basically. But um, I take advantage of any possibilities like this one and tertulias, as we call it. And, and also, um, I, I enjoy uh, preparing uh, short videos and sharing on YouTube. Also, who knows who you can touch uh, somehow. Poetry just flies like winds, finding new avenues. 
Yes, I bet it was probably um, challenging for you guys as I'm your only audience member you can see today <laughs> and get a reaction from, okay. but hopefully I gave you enough feedback that, you know, it helped as well, because I know how it how it is uh, public speaking and sharing and you, you get you feed a lot of, uh, you know, your energy off of what the audience is reacting or how they're reacting to you and the facial expressions that they have. And, you know, all of that, it just comes into play. And, and then uh, how you continue, like, to bring forth that energy with intensity. And I tell you what, all of you guys did that for me today. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Alondra? Yeah. Um, I, I like what you said, Huang, about poetry finding new avenues. Um, I think if there's something that I'd love to do at least once in my life is contribute to some kind of like poetry and mural projects so badly. Oh my gosh. Especially since Boston, there's murals everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. It's crazy. There's always something new popping up. Um, I think I prefer like reading in front of an audience um, I think a lot of and most of honestly the work that I read or write is meant to be read. Um, I love music and before I started writing poetry which I realized I never actually mentioned I started writing poetry when I was 12 but before I started writing poetry I used to like writing songs and I was really into music and I think that's because I was also a dancer and so kind of all just made sense to me. Um, so I like playing around with the rhythm of my work or the melody, if you will. And I like seeing people's like responses and hearing their responses when you're reading, especially like a really active audience. I hate silence. I hate just people just kind of staring at you and don't really know exactly how to respond. And I also don't like, um, I guess, typical reactions from like typical spoken word audiences because I also feel like that's predictable. I really love like natural audience reactions, especially from people who have probably never been to no spoken word events are not, you know, like maybe go to, you know, these kinds of events frequently in general, don't know like the proper etiquette, their reactions are the best because they will sit here and like just go along with you as if they're singing along with like your song. And that is so invigorating because it makes my like reading a lot more organic and I feel like I can't hear that little voice in my head that's interrupting me while I'm reading <laughs> so <laughs> I, that for me the louder the audience the better it is for me that's great yeah I'm interested I'm I uh didn't share with you guys but I'm actually zooming in from Fairbanks Alaska mm -hmm. and so uh hence my mispronunciation of Worcester. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I'm excited to see the murals in Boston. I actually get to come for the first time in May and see all my colleagues from GBH that I've been working with remotely. <laughs> and it would be incredible to have your poetry out on a mural there. I encourage you to get involved. Yeah, that's awesome. Ariel. Ah, uh, hello. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm pretty insecure person. Uh, I'd say um, I really don't like sharing my poetry as much as people think I do. Um, my very first um, poems are are all gone. I used to just write them, burn them, throw them away, hide them get rid of them because it was it was something that was real for me um I, I had to grow up very fast and because of that my writings just it didn't fit the person I was playing in real life so it made me very scared of what the world would uh think of me when they saw my writings because it's like it's like um it splits it's uh the right my all my writings are a piece of me but um were two completely different um, entities. But just so I'm not a buzzkill, 
I really like performing in very, very large crowds. I eventually want to take poetry to um, stadiums uh, because I feel like poetry uh, has something very theatrical about it. And I know a bunch of um, directors have created um, uh, plays and musical uh, based off of poetry. And there's even like a genre of poetry theater but nah, 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 I want to do it better. Um, so yeah, I really like very, very large crowds. The, the larger the crowd, um, the better I feel. Um, I'm one of those who likes to hang out in large crowds. I love New York for the reason of I, I just feel lost. And it feels really good knowing that there's so many souls just there. It's something about the energy. Um, I go to a lot of concerts as well. It's probably one of my favorite things to do. Top three. <laughs> <laughs> well, you read today so profoundly and it was certainly um, a pleasure. And I was also like incredibly impressed um, at your reading and blown away uh, by your poem. And I remember writing poetry at, when I was a teenager and feeling like it was an opportunity to express so much of what was going on inside. And I too also hid a lot of my poems and then stopped writing. Um, so I encourage you, and it sounds like you will, continue on in this realm of artistry. And yeah, the sky is the limit. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's only the beginning. Um, I'm <laughs> finding my my place. I think so. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Another question for the full group: What do you feel is the role of poetry in our society? Ooh, can I yes. go first? Please. Sure. I was going <laughs> to ask you to. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yo, poetry is something that you hold on to. In my head at random points, I get just quotes from movies, songs. It, it happens to everybody, the, the little earworms that we have. Mm -hmm. And poetry is, is a perfect example of that because sometimes the rhyme flow is so technical that 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 it, it lays it into your head and um with times changing and the way that the art world is um kind of going to world uh to war with the business world i think um poetry is a strong voice for the arts for diversity for culture and it's one of uh the most overlooked art because of its history we look at it as such a technical um art style but the the freedom in it is is what uh cultivates uh eras it, it, it captures audiences and it's important it is yes Juan, it sounded like you wanted to continue. <laughs> yes, uh, as I expressed my, uh, before, poetry gives us the opportunity to be that plural voice for those voiceless. Um, I remember my first encounter with Walt Whitman. Uh, I was in middle school and thanks God for the translations that uh, was done by Leon Felipe and and other wonderful writer, Jorge Luis Borges. And I always thank God for my teacher in sixth grade who introduced us to Walt Whitman in, in, in language art classes, of course, in Spanish. But I, I, when I heard that, that he said, cada átomo de tu cuerpo es tuyo, when, when, in, in, when listening to Walt Whitman saying that every single atom on his body is mine to say, oh, someone is talking to me through centuries. And that's what poetry is. Poetry is history. The history of the family, the history of society, the voice of, of social justice, the, love, the, the voice of love, of course. 
when, for instance, my favorite poet ever, Paolo Neruda, is such a well known for those uh, 20 uh, poems of love and a desperate song, as well as his um, social and political poetry. Because uh, as an artist, every single artist, I think, the way I learned, has the responsibility to to be the voice for, for social justice and defend our countries and all those things is, and, uh, and express uh, the feelings and, uh, and the need of people that feel they don't have a voice. So therefore it's a huge responsibility. It's not an act of vanity, it's a, it's a sense of responsibility, um, giving back what society gives you, yes. Eileen, the one I, I love that you came to um, to Walt Whitman through Leon Felipe, which is, is a poet who actually started publishing so late in life, right? It's such a very interesting story he has as well. Um, and, and I really love listening to all of you, you know, sort of talk about the role that poetry has had for you. I, I find that my definitions of poetry are, are a little cryptic always. <laughs> um, uh, one of my favorite poets, Jack Spicer, uh, says something along the lines of the the poem is the poet is a time mechanic not an embalmer you know um and i like that idea you know of, of our role is to sort of um in a way translate across time but also translate um i don't know ourselves into the world the world into ourselves i think language um has this capacity to actually uh do the work that mm -hmm. other forms can't sometimes. And I answer that as a poet, right? Because probably visual artists feel the same way about, you know, visual art and musicians feel the same way about music, but somehow poetry chose me. So I don't know if the world itself <laughs> is something, you know, if I can resolve, we can resolve here the entire relationship between the, you know, poet world and, and um, poem, but, whatever keeps bringing me back to poetry is the same thing that brings me to other people and to connect with other people. So um, I thank poetry for that. I love everything that you guys said. I love language. I wish I knew more languages. I just don't have the patience to learn. Um, but I love languages and I love how human beings communicate um, through more than just what we understand as language. We communicate through body language, we communicate through painting on a canvas, we communicate in many ways. I see poetry as like its own language because um, oftentimes we use poetry to, I like that word, Raquel, translate, like translate um, the world that's around us as well as our own personal experiences like our emotions and and things to that effect um i believe that everything just focusing more on on art forms for now um that they all have a place and a really important role in society and i feel that they're all like different instruments if you will um to connect with people across borders especially since that everything that we seem to understand from like an academic or just like a daily everyday living level feels, um, you know, like it causes more division at times, even when it seeks to unify. And I think art is that special touch, that special vehicle that I just think is still very underappreciated, uh, even by those very same people who also seek to unify are always like, yeah, but how is a song or that workshop going to help the kids, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, watch that song or that workshop be exactly what keeps these kids in your classroom. You just don't see it that way, right? Because you don't see the value because you're so focused on the instrument and the vehicle that, you know, you feel called to or that you think is most important. But everyone has an instrument to play mm -hmm. and all of them need to be valued for our society to kind of, you know, continue to evolve. Um, and you know, even on a more particular level, even after my, my grandmother had dementia um, and she passed away, and one of the only things that she could remember were poems and entire plays and songs. Mm. Wow. Like, you know what I mean? So for me, when I 
you know, I, I never like to be too dramatic and like to say that the instruments that I feel, you know, called to and like God given are like my life. No, because I'll survive without it. But that was literally all my grandmother had as her life tangibly. It was the only thing that we could understand. And like when she would do check marks because she was a teacher. And mm -hmm. so she would just do these random check marks everywhere. That's how she understood the word or, you know, the world around her. And, you know, for me, you, even when I think about like Alzheimer's research, I know someone personally that's something that she does, you know, with her own husband after he like passed away that, you know, like in home care, keeping people in their homes. And one of the main things that people have been utilizing is music and like reminding people of theater, reminding people of poetry. So, you know, people love to kind of, some people like to overlook the importance of, of the arts in our everyday lives. And yet for so many people, that's the last thing that they remember. So if everything else that we supposedly say is so important was important, why is that? Why don't why don't we remember it <laughs> in our last and final days? There's a reason for that. You know, there's a moment for everything. There's a there's something for everything, and everything has a place. Yes, I love everything that you guys have said, and something that kind of um, was coming to me as each of you talked in the collective kind of summary is it's as though it's a translation of the human experience, mm -hmm. and that you guys are playing your part, your instrument, as you said. And with when everybody plays their part, the part that they're creative in, it makes a harmony that is unlike anything else, unlike the individual. And it is through our collective human experience that we can make this life even more beautiful. So I appreciate all that you guys are doing to translate <laughs> and to share, to express emotion, to help other people express themselves, to help people see the world in another way, to advocate, to bring justice to. It is amazing. I appreciate each of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. I know we weren't able to get to all of our questions this evening. We appreciate everybody tuning in to be on the page tonight. And a special thank you to all of you, Ariel, Alondra, Juan, and Raquel. That was such a profound um, time with you. I appreciate your time this evening, the time that you spent writing down your thoughts, um, perfecting them and continuing. Thank you. So we're very excited to announce that next month's Beyond the Page will be with New York Times bestselling author and wicked creator, Gregory McGuire. So please keep your eye out for upcoming emails to register for this event. And as always, you can join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics. We hope all of you had an amazing night. I certainly did and cannot wait to see you all again next month. Thank you so much. And we hope you have a wonderful night.